All right, so we'll go ahead and get started. Thank you all for coming out today. I know we just got back from break. Energy may still be a little spent, but glad everyone is here regardless. So today I'm introducing to you Travis Donnell. He is a graduate of Maryville College, graduated in 2011 with a bachelor's uh, in mathematics and computer science. Back then it was one degree. I'm sure he's going to touch on that a little bit about his path, his tra trajectory. He then went on to attend uh, Northeastern University until 2014. Uh, he spent some time there uh, working on a thesis track as well as a teaching assistant and then went on to uh, start with Pilot Flying J in 2014 as a developer. In 2016, he moved to be a part of the application or uh, the security division and has been there since. And please help me welcome Travis. Thank you all for having me here. Uh, it's been 13 years, I guess, since I last presented before a group this large, so I beg your forgiveness for any hurdles I might encounter. Those of you with thesis presentations coming up or have done a thesis presentation in the past probably understand the, the butterflies and the nervousness, but we'll see if we can work through some of that. Thank you, Brett. I am Travis Donnell, as he said. Uh, today I'm hoping to talk to you a little bit about uh, what my career track has looked like, as I understand that is what this speech uh, series is about, where you are today at Maryville College and where you might wind up in the future and how those tracks might look a little different from everybody else. In addition, I'm going to touch a little bit on some technical side of what I do day to day in application security and hopefully maybe strike some interest in that field from you all. So first and foremost, thank you Maribel. I've got a few special thank yous, one for Brett for inviting me here, one for Dr. Johnson for all of her extensive training and my time here. Thank you very much, Nan. Um, and because uh, retirement has left her board, thank you to my mother for showing up as well. Um, try and maintain a good relationship with your parents when you can. Uh, today, I find myself at Pilot Flying J as a senior application security engineer. As mentioned, I transitioned over time from a developer to that role. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about that transition period uh, coming up here. Uh, I, in my day-to-day, -day, will find myself teaching secure coding procedures to our software developers, and developers, you need it, let's be honest. I additionally will manage the application vulnerability program at Pilot. As you imagine, in a world where companies have extensive digital footprints, keeping a secure front line in front of their corporate assets is incredibly important and can be incredibly complicated and difficult at times. I'm sure you see news articles from time to time about this or that ransomware or other breach at companies. I know the big one right now is with the United Healthcare ransomware event, if you paid any attention to that. Uh, in addition, when time permits, I do some penetration testing. This is the, the glitzy, glammy side of it. I get to be our red hat in-house hacker at the company. So I will attack our own applications and verify that the developers have learned a thing or two about how to secure their software. But where did it start? Well. Here, Maribel, I guess that's 2011 is when I left, 2007 when I started. But it wasn't always computer science. I was a chemistry and biology major at the time. From some early aspirations for a doctor, I came here to Maribel with the hope of finding my way into the medical field. As some of you may be attached to chemistry and biology, I apologize for what I'm about to say next. I did not find it particularly exciting. A lot of memorization, that was not particularly my forte, but thankfully I had some friends in my dorm that were in a different career track. They were computer science and they were people that I am glad to still have friends to, to be friends with to this day. Computer science changed my life. I know that's kind of overplayed, but it really did. I pivoted in my sophomore year, I believe, into computer science, just dabbling at first before jumping into a full hog. But what do you do at the end of that? Some of you are graduating soon. Some of you may not be thinking about graduation, but those thoughts have to come up eventually. For myself, I thought about graduate school. It was 2011, the economy was still in a bit of a tricky spot, and the real world was still a bit of a scary place to me. I thought, well, why not just college 2.0? It's more studying, more learning, and gives me an opportunity to try something else. So on a lark, I applied to Northeastern University, up in Boston for their information assurance program. 
It did not go well on the initial ask. They offered me a master's track at uh, no financial backing, but with a little coaxing, and I will encourage you if you ever look at graduate school, go there in person, talk to people, meet with them, that face-to-face -face can make a significant difference in the offering that they make to you. So at the end of the day, the offer they turned around and made to me was a PhD track, a full ride with a research assistantship scholarship. Go socks. So, PhD, information assurance, that's another four years, just like you are here at Maribel. It's a lot of work, it is a lot of more courses, but it gives you an opportunity to try out some other things. Like in most graduate level programs at that level, you will get tied to another professor and work on their research. In my particular instance, I was working on a project for something called Perfect Forward Secrecy. The details aren't important, but what matters is it's a system by which any compromised data in the now cannot also be used to compromise past data. It was a little over my head. At the end of my Maripopol experience, my security knowledge was fairly limited, and I frankly lucked out on the invite to the program in the first place. But I found that the PhD program, and really that kind of graduate level expectation, just wasn't for me. It is a very different world from undergraduate. You may not think it, you might think it is just advanced college, but there's a degree of expectation around the program that can be a little jarring. Thankfully, I had the opportunity to instead, at the end of two years, try to back out with just a master's. It's the same work, just two years less of it. You still shoot for thesis at the end of it in this particular case. Not all programs do that. But at the end of the day, you still have something for your hard work. Unfortunately for me, I wound up not really culminating in anything. I, at the end of the day, did not make it out of that master's program with a degree due to a combination of life issues as well as just the difficulty of the program and the thesis. That thesis is hard. Any of those programs are hard and the expectations are high. But don't be afraid of the failure. Try to learn from it. Thankfully, that didn't keep me from getting to pilot when I returned to Knoxville through some social connections, and I do highly encourage you to establish social connections wherever you want, wherever you can. As much as your own knowledge and willpower can drive your career, who you know often matters as much as what you know. It doesn't feel good to admit that, but it's true. And through those connections, I'm able to get my feet wet at Pilot as an application developer. I spent a couple years there working on primarily .NET applications, that's going to be, I think, the developers you're all working mostly with Python now, but it's the, the primary language platform that Microsoft runs. It's prevalent across much of the industry. It was a good taste of some professional development experience. At the end of that 2015, 2016 period, Pilot was trying to spin up its first instance of a security team. At the time, there were only five people on it, and thanks to the exposure that I had in the master's and PhD program, I was able to turn that into an interview with that security team where I uh, suppose I impressed them enough to get an invite to that team. And I've been thankful for that ever since. It, it can be very difficult to find a team that you really truly jive with. And thankfully, I lucked into a fantastic team. Again, small, but maybe this is overplayed, it definitely felt like a family. Most of them were former military, they had some very close connections, um, and we really grew together as a team into the program we have today, where I think at present we're sitting at 50 headcount, so we've grown significantly in that time period. Now, because I had somewhat limited knowledge in security, and that program was still trying to build itself up, that inevitably means that there's a lot to learn, both for yourself and for the rest of the program. So, for really any career, but in particular for a field like security, like cybersecurity, there's going to be an expectation of a great degree of self-teaching throughout everything that you do. Have an interest in whatever you're doing, because if you don't, you're going to get bored of it, and then you're not going to want to do it. So, overall some lessons and reflections on this track. It's not exactly what I was expecting, but at the core of it, what was important was that college at first gave me choices. You, 
when you walk in the doors at Maribel might have your heart set on one thing. It might be chemistry, biology. It might be theater. I, I spent some time in the theater while I was here. But keep an eye out for where you see other opportunities for personal growth and for potential career growth. Graduate school is more than just college again. Don't walk into that expecting it to be the same easy ride as everything else. Again, not every program is the same, but depending on where you go and what you do, it might truly be the first time that you are accountable for yourself as an adult. I know you're all 18 plus, you are adults, but college, undergraduate college, is not the same experience. It is a different world. Failure happens. I didn't finish that degree. I'm still planning on trying to see if I can't turn that into something. Those credits are still typically good for a while. But don't give up. Don't let that stop you from pursuing whatever else you can. Social skills, those connections I talked about, they matter a lot. Not just for getting jobs, and again, referring to the computer science people, a lot of jobs once you're in industry will be about who you can make connections with, who you can call up to get your CV in front of the right people. But presentation skills, if you're working in an environment where you might need to be presenting to a corporate board, those are gonna matter a lot. And it's not just being able to communicate with people with your same skill set. You need to be able to communicate to people outside your skill set as well. Not everybody is gonna have the same technical expertise that you do. You're gonna need to be able to translate it into language that they understand, make it, in the case of a business, something that is business critical, interest, dollars. Those dollar values speak a lot, especially in the case of security, where you typically do not make money for a company. You cost them money, but you are an insurance against true loss. And at the end of the day, some things are just down to luck. If I did not happen to have the team that I wound up with at Pilot, that wonderful team, I don't know that I would still be in that industry either. Because they kept me there. It's hard. There's a lot of hard work that goes into it. And having the right people and a little bit of luck can ensure that your career goes where you expect it to. All right, that's enough talking about me. Let's talk about that cybersecurity. The second half of the conversation is gonna be a little more on the technical side. It's gonna be something that hopefully is at an intro level that people can pick up on. There should be some themes and elements that are familiar to people that have been taking some of the courses um, I was speaking with Dr. Johnson earlier, theory, uh, your relational database experience, your UI development experience for you software developers, all of those things will be relevant in the security field because for as many options as there are in computer science and software development, all of those platforms need somebody to take care of them at the end of the day. And that's where security comes into play. So, a lot of options, I said. Well, let's talk about very broad strokes. In the security space where I operate, there's typically two groups of roles. There's red team and there's blue team. Offense and defense. That's oversimplifying it. You know, there's concepts of a purple team where you're really intermingling the two operations. But by and large, in the security space, offense attackers, defense defends the infrastructure. So what kind of opportunities are present there within that space? Social engineering. You probably see uh, videos sometimes of people that are just talking themselves into places where they shouldn't be. Or you'll hear scammers calling you up trying to get information from you. That is, in simple forms, social engineering. They are trying to use your own human nature against you to some ends. In the case of a company like Pilot, that might be cases where our users are being, again, called up by scammers who are trying to pretend to be help desk or desktop support trying to get them to give up for passwords. It might include things like open source intelligence gathering in order to make your con more believable. So be careful what you put out there on social media. People can use it against you. Physical penetration testing. This is one that's not talked about as often, but it fits somewhere in that social engineering realm. These are individuals who specialize in gaining physical access to spaces that they shouldn't be. Oftentimes this will be highly sensitive facilities, like in the case of Pilot, we have facilities that process fuel, and you wanna keep people out of those facilities because it can be dangerous for themselves and others, as well as in the case of like Department of Defense or other industries, there might be 
significant secrets present. So physical penetration testers are the ones that are gaining expertise in lock breaking or in using uh, magnetic devices to trigger motion alarms and things like that. Uh, I, you may have heard some talk of individuals who have broken into uh, courthouses as part of tests and things like that. Uh, all of those places are potentially highly sensitive, so making sure that you have a firm grasp of the physical premises and what you're doing to protect it matters in that field greatly. Network penetration testing. This starts to get a little closer to where I live, so whereas you may be working with software front-end applications, at the back-end there are still the network infrastructures that exist. That's where all the communication channels exist. That's where a lot of your core environment authentication and authorization system exists. There are people who specialize in this environment and do some really nasty things, and frankly it's a space I would like to learn a lot more about myself. But my specialty is more in the web application penetration testing. This is a place that most companies and most uh, places even like Marable have a lot of interest themselves because this is your face to the public internet. If it's not secure, it's a point at which people can pivot into the rest of your network. So when we start talking about UI design and some of the uh, methods by which people might attack your infrastructure, this is a space in particular where there will be uh, relevance. Finally, on the red team side, and again, oversimplifying, there's any number of different opportunities within the, within the space. Bug bounty and ethical hacking. You might have heard these terms before. This is kind of a, a catch-all term for people that will do the very same testing we're talking about here with like our web app testing, but for profit. Oftentimes there'll be freelance bounty hunters on various programs that will attack your company's infrastructure, try to find vulnerabilities in it, and then present them to you cleanly, well-written, with proof of concept, and responsibly, so that the company can then take that information and fix their systems. I need to emphasize that this entire career space at cybersecurity is one of those spaces that flirts that gray area between legality and illegality. Just like you know, a gun can be used or for good or bad purposes, the, the tools and techniques that you gain in the cybersecurity space can be used for legal or illegal purposes. So ethical frameworks within this space are incredibly important. Being a responsible disclosure of these issues Always encourage it if you get into the space. If you ever find yourself in a situation where you're not sure if what you're about to do may or may not breach your code of ethics, it's often better to hang back because not every company is very friendly when they're told that their system has a problem. There have been any number of individuals in the program space that find themselves on the wrong side of a courthouse at the end of the day because they ruffled somebody's feathers. Now, the blue team side. Incident response. Well, what happens when somebody breaks into a system or penetrates your network? Well, somebody needs to be able to hunt that down. Between the people that are operating directly on the incident response, as well as the threat hunting themselves within their logs, these are the ground troops in your defensive efforts within any kind of network to try and find operators. Whenever there's suspicion of fraudulent activity within your network, you know, North Korea has broken into your, system, your systems again, these are the people that are looking at your network logs, trying to identify that. It is a skill that I do not possess. It is a very particularized set that requires you to be able to identify patterns pretty readily in vast quantities of data, terabytes, petabytes of data. These people are highly talented at it. Forensics, well, you probably hear this a little more on the legal space, but for any digital device, at the end of the day, you may need to be able to retrieve data off of it whether it's for law enforcement or whether it's for a company trying to figure out somebody in their company's been fleecing them. A forensics expert is gonna have the skills and tools to pull that out of memory, pull that off the hard disk, do whatever analysis is necessary in order to find what they're looking for and provide you with evidence. General operations. This is the bread and butter of any large program. This is gonna be the people that are setting up the basic antivirus systems or the call it far more advanced antivirus systems that ex exist out there. These are the people that are ensuring that the core operations of your environment are as secure as possible. Information assurance and risk, these are a little less on the technical side, these are very much more on the soft, uh, soft skills side of things. This is where people like 
technical writers or people with an interest in uh, policy and procedure go, typically. Um, it is a space that will dictate the ins and outs of any kind of corporate structure in terms of what you can and can't do. They're the ones who care about uh, compliance for PCI, for HIPAA, for any number of different requirements that might be out there, whether they are uh, uh, industry requirements or uh, government requirements. Uh, any, any big company needs these people. And then finally, one of the spaces that I particularly like is malware analysis. So those same ransomware events that I mentioned, oftentimes they're coming into your environment as some malware payload, obfuscated, broken up into different pieces. You have no idea what's, what it's doing until you can really get down under the hood, look at the core assembly code, and really start to piece it together and reverse engineer exactly what it's doing. It's a fascinating field, and if anybody has a mind for uh, any of those kind of nitty-gritty details of jump operations and things like that, I highly encourage taking a further look at it. Like I said, my specialization, however, at Pilot is predominantly in the web application testing area. I do work as a jack-of-all-trades within this particular company. Not every company does that. Some are very specialized in different parts <laughs> of the fields. But for myself, I manage and run our web application program. All right. Web application testing. Since this is my specialty, this is where I want to focus a little bit in today. Within this field, there are many ways to organize the various exploits that exist. One of them, one of the ones that's a little more uh, readily available to most people, is OWASP. It's the uh, Open Web Application Security Project, I believe is what it comes down to, but it's an open source uh, set of rules and categories for the different types of exploits out there. There are many others. Uh, some are um, government driven or otherwise NIST, things like that. But this is the one that I tend to lean on because it's a little easier to digest. And what OWASP has thankfully done for us is broken down some of the biggest categories of threats into a nice top 10 list. I'm not going to go through all of these, um, but they run the gambit from basic cryptographic issues to how your logging systems are structured, how data flows across your network, how different servers are configured. Um, this is just a drop in the bucket. There are any a number of other categories outside of this, but for our technical purposes today, I wanna hone in on injection attacks specifically because it's one that I think most people wind up running into first when they're operating in a security space and really starting to just learn about it. And it's one that should be particularly relevant to you people and your UI designs coming up. So, injection attacks. Again, many varieties. There's cross-site scripting, which may exist in web browsers. There's XML external entity issues. There's LDAP injections, command injections, SQL injections, et cetera, et cetera. For every technology in the space, there's potentially a type of injection. But why? It's one type of attack. Why is it so prevalent across all these different programmatic infrastructures? Because at the end of the day, what it comes down to is your inputs and your outputs. So for any program, any application you run out there that's got some kind of input, you may have an injection attack. And the more injections, the more input spaces you have, the more possibilities there are for these injection attacks. But what is an injection? What causes these injections? At the end of the day, it's a lack of input and output validation and sanitization. Those of you who've ever worked with any application, and it's not just the developers, anybody who's ever been on a website that's expecting a birth date, if you've ever tried to type in letters, it should stop you. Or if you're typing in a field that should be, you know, what's your age, and it doesn't, and it lets you go beyond, you know, 120 or something like that. It's not doing appropriate input sanitization validation. And if you don't do that, there's a chance that you're putting yourself at risk for some unexpected behaviors. At the end of the day, unexpected data, when injected into your system, can undergo dynamic queries directly on these interpreters and cause unforeseen consequences. These injections will depend very much on the platform you're interacting with. Most people that are interacting with a web browser may eventually come across the instance of a cross-site scripting vulnerability because that deals primarily with JavaScript, which runs the internet. But if you ever work with a SQL Server instance, for those of you who've done any relational database work, you might experience SQL injections. Any command line work, you might be command injections. 
For every technology, there is an injection. So let's start walking through an example of what I'm talking about. In very, very simple terms, applications are finite state machines, or in theory, finite state machines, depending on how you've constructed it. You have a set of inputs and a set of uh, states that you would expect based on those inputs. As you process that input through your application, it should land in specific states that you know ahead of time if you've structured your application appropriately. If you've taken theory, computer science theory, or discrete mathematics, I believe, you might have some exposure to state machines. Um, I'm not going to go into the nitty gritty of state machines, I'm just using it as an example here. But again, at the end of the day, inputs derive your states and outputs. So let's look at a very simple example of a state machine here for a login workflow. You enter in your credentials and either you have a successful login with correct credentials or an unsuccessful login with the wrong credentials, potentially with a lockout state depending on your setup. That's about as basic as we can get with our state machine. So you're passing in your credentials. You've got your username and you've got your password. And now you should either go to your success or your unsuccess, non-successful login states. You would expect one of those outcomes if you use good credentials or bad credentials. But what if the application receives input it just doesn't expect? It's not a name, it's not a password, it's something unusual. If you've not accounted for the unusual, where's that state gonna go? Well, depending on the application, it may unexpectedly go to another success. Well, that's not a user. That's not a username, that's not a password. Why would that succeed? SQL injection. This is one of the classic, classic injection attacks that you may encounter. And it's the first one that I ever exploited myself. A SQL injection, as the name would suggest, is very much dependent on the SQL technology that you are tied to. There are all kinds of different database injection attacks that exist out there for the different types of databases, but specifically, SQL injections are tied to those SQL relations, relational databases. Much like any other injection attack, it results from dynamic evaluation of untrusted input directly on the database, which is why those input fields look unusual. You wouldn't expect a user to typically enter those in for uh, their username and password, and your application might not recognize and know what to do with them, but I bet your database does. So let's look at what the core query is, in all likelihood, for this login event. Select star from users where username is a username and password is a password. It's about as simple as it gets. Give me every user where their username is that value and their password is that value. In theory, that should only ever result in one user. Again, we're oversimplifying here, but there should only ever likely be one user with an exact matching set of those credentials. But if you use that alternative input, what does that do to your query. Well, now we've got a closing statement here. We have a new boolean being rendered. And then there's this thing. So what do each of these stages do? What effect do they have on the statement being rendered? If you've taken the database class, you might have an idea. First of all, that single quote, that closes your username argument. So now your initial statement is select star from users where username is empty. Well, in a well-structured database, you probably don't have any users that are a blank value in there. So your Boolean statement's gonna render false. That shouldn't return anything, right? Well, that's where our next statement comes in, or we, one equals one. That, that's a truism, that's always true. One is always going to be equal to one. So now you have a combinative Boolean statement between one statement that's false and one statement that's true. So now this whole statement evaluates is true, and it should return output. But we still have more information here. This is gonna mess up everything. So that's where the double dash comes in. In your technology, and again, these are very technology specific, your implementations might change from tech stack to tech stack, called log4j that spawned out a very hectic time in my corporate existence. Um, as an attack dubbed log4shell, was discovered and it was based very much on one of these injection attacks. 
It existed in a very specific set of uh, versions of the library, but unfortunately, that library, much like the platform that it's built on, is very popular. Java, as a language, is I think like the sixth most popular programming language in the world. Um, and that Log4j, which is a logging framework, uh, is one of the most popular forms of writing logs in that language. Well, unfortunately, or fortunately, depending on how you look at it, somebody found a remote code execution vulnerability in this library. As popular as it is, it was everywhere. Steam, Apple iCloud, Minecraft. I've seen versions of this where people use Minecraft servers to, to run code like this. But with a remote code execution vulnerability, this is about the worst of the worst as it can get because it lets your application run basic commands on the operating system. You can get it to run whatever you want it to rather than what your application accounted for. So short version of how it works. That log would receive untrusted user data. It could be from anywhere in the application. It could be from a comment field. It could be from somebody's name. It could be from an HTTP header. It could be from any number of locations. Um, in our example here, it could be right in a URL somewhere. Anywhere that it's being logged to where Log4j had eyes on it, this could potentially run because Log4j, as it turns out, had the ability to interact with Active Directory and user services. So in one of these locations, you could pass this injection payload or something similar to it where you're telling the Java naming and directory interface to make an LDAP request to a server that you, the attacker, control on a location for your stager. The stager being just the location to set up and wait for that call to come in, wait for your victim to arrive. That stager returns a response now to the server who's making the request because the, the user at this point is out of the loop. The server has made this request to the stager and so the re server rec receives back response to point to another location where you might have a vulnerable or a malicious payload. It could be ransomware, it could be a rat, it could be a backdoor into the system. It could be any number of things that the attacker wanted to do. But it was that simple to get any application that's running this uh, Log4j program to do whatever you wanted to. Anything. So, what kind of impact did such a simple injection have? Well, at the time, uh, Koalas, who's like a pretty big name in the security space, did some analysis and they found that something like 90% of Fortune 500 companies use Java in at least one of their major applications uh, that they run. Within 72 hours, they were seeing millions of attacks for this exact same payload. You remember when I was talking about responsible disclosure? This is one of those cases where responsible disclosure was not practiced. Normally, an, a program, a platform, a company that runs something like Log4j, I think is owned by Apache or under the Apache project, you would let them know that this vulnerability exists, give them some time to fix it, and then maybe post your blog post out there saying, hey, look at this cool thing I did. This particular one, Log4Shell, first started popping up on some forums on a uh, hacker group in China. Their concept of responsible disclosure is fairly different in some of those spaces, and as a result, it very quickly spread across uh, Twitter, it spread across uh, any number of other social media platforms, and everybody figured it out really dang quick. Unfortunately, it's still out there. Some companies don't have the resources, some people don't have the time or the interest to update their systems. There are any number of applications out there that are still vulnerable to this day. And at this point, the attack is fully automated. It's in any number of tools and platforms out there running every second of every day. I, I watch the attacks come in all the time on our systems. Thankfully, we're not exposed because we're not a Java shop. But once these types of attacks are figured out, they're automatic. If you ever drop another system onto the public internet with this vulnerability on it, expect to be compromised within an hour. That's the reality of these types of attacks. So what's the future of cybersecurity look like? These attacks have been around forever. These versions of attacks have been around forever, but they keep coming back. Every new framework introduces a new version. The landscape changes all the time. 
Like I, all the talk now was about AI and the, the LLMs. Well, there's a whole other injection for that, prompt injection. Those systems might not do what you expect them to if they get unusual input. If you're passing it a photo with alt text that's asking it to do something else, well, it, that's maybe not what the developer intended, but maybe the model is gonna run with that alt text instead now. Those prompt injections are just the next phase of the same issue with input validation and your output validations. But I love it. I love every second of it because every one of these problems is a puzzle just waiting to be solved. I like to move the pieces around, figure out how it all fits together, and then figure out how to protect my company from it because they pay me. In the field, I will say though, I know maybe this isn't what the teachers want to hear, some of the best people I know in this field are self-taught. It's a field that is still relatively new and has limited <laughs> adoption in higher education. So in terms of resources for you to learn some of these things, they're all out there, but you have to be able to hunt for it. There's any number of platforms that will teach you some basic stuff, over the wire, hack the box. Sans, who's kind of one of the big names in the security space, but boy are they pricey. They do a holiday hack every year for Christmas that's got Santa themed and you break into Santa's systems and save them from an evil Cindy Lou Who and whatever's going on. But everywhere you look, there are opportunities to learn more if you're interested in pursuing it. And it has to be driven by your interest because again, you probably don't have access to classes typically to learn this. And that's it. little time here at the end for Q&A if anybody, I believe, correct me if I'm wrong, Brett. Yes, we have a time for questions. Okay. So, the log shell hacking that went on a couple years back, some remnants of that original attack are still floating around. <laughs> yes, and then some, because not only is the original attack still going to work on applications that are in that version space that we were talking about, so, you know, this between this 2 beta and 2.14.1, new versions of this same attack have been found that either bypass the fixes that were put in place or take advantage of other pieces of the Log4j application to do what they want. That's the difficulty with platforms or with, uh, with packages like Log4j that do a lot more than maybe you would expect a logging framework to do. Any of those extra little features can be bugs and bugs can mean problems. Anyone else? Yes? What do you do when you your job? Yeah, so Pilot has, I think at my last count, something like 350 software developers between on-premise corporate developers and offshore resources. They write a lot of code, as you can imagine. So a lot of my day-to-day -day is taking a look at their code, running it through static analyzers, checking some dynamic analyzers, trying to see where vulnerabilities might exist, or making sure that they aren't still using outdated third-party dependencies that might be introducing risk to the company. So that's a lot of my day-to-day. -day. Um, as I've moved up into uh, a managerial, managerial role, I've got a team now that I have to uh, stay on top of. They do a lot of the same kind of work. Um, so it's code reviews, it's uh, tool evaluations. Uh, we do a lot of consulting with other teams around the company whenever they have a question. Uh, we've got a big ongoing project right now around how does the company use AI, so we're getting pulled into that, those conversations a lot. Um, but m the, the bread and butter of my day to day is typically code reviews uh, and tool output analysis. I have a question. I know that you said you transitioned from an application developer <coughs> to the security role. Did that involve you having to do any more extracurriculars like certifications? Like I know CompTIA has a whole suite of like Security Plus and CEH. I yeah. don't know if you had to do any of those. Or did um, I, I did not. Um, the When I first interviewed a pilot before my developer role, uh, I'd already had a little bit of the security experience from the, my time in Boston. The security manager as he was starting up his team, sat in on that interview and asked me some particular questions. So he knew I had some of that exposure. 
Um, and then in my two years as a developer, he would come to me and we would periodically touch base and mentor on some security work that the company needed doing. And so I, while I was still a developer, was starting to already transition into some of those security responsibilities. I, I said at the beginning that luck can be a major factor all in all of this, and I lucked out that, that manager was is not the was not the kind of person that necessarily required or desired cert certification. So I did not need that. I do encourage people to seek it out where appropriate, though, because not everybody is like that. Some people have to go through the HR laundry list of okay, do they have their four year degree? Do they have this to that? So like some of that is just kind of the office politics, but it, most of those classes are still going to provide some useful information, whether it's the CompTIA, whether it's an A plus, whether it's, you know, if you shell out eight grand for a SANS course, um, any of those, uh, any of those groups will teach you some of what you need to know, but what they're teaching is very much a example. Here is our specific use case. It does not necessarily account for all the other options and opportunities out there, which is why being willing and interested in self-teaching, I think, is still a core necessity of this field today. Anyone else? I think I'm at your 250 or 115. If there are no final questions, let's go ahead and give our speaker another round of applause.